Good afternoon from Gettysburg Battlefield. Today is Tuesday, 19th of April, 2022. I'm out here today at Gettysburg on the battlefield, and this is a free live stream uh, event, so uh, no charge to you guys. I'm just out on the battlefield live streaming today. We wanted to, well, I wanted to be talking about um, uh, Archer's Brigade today. Um, for those of you that have watched some of these other live streams, what I like to do when I'm out on the battlefield is it's very easy I'm, where I'm standing. If we just take a quick look back across there towards the Union line on Cemetery Ridge, it'd be very easy just to talk about Pickett's Charge and Pickett's Charge, Pickett's Charge. But, um, you know, within those big main events that take place during the battle, there are smaller stories to be told from the perspective of individual units. Uh, so um, previous tours, we've talked about um, individual units. We've talked about um, brigade strength, such as Lane's Brigade. We've talked about um, the Vermont Brigade a couple of weeks ago. And we've talked about um, individual regiments even, like the Bloody 16th, 16th Maine. So we try to drill down, I try to drill down to a, a smaller story and we can tell the bigger picture from that smaller story. It just kind of makes it a more um, intimate story. So I see that we're getting spam links coming up already um, on the post. So whatever you do, do not click on those spam links. I'm going to ban those guys and uh, uh, delete them as quickly as I can. But at the moment, I'm uh, unable to from the phone. So, but please don't click on those links. They seem to swarm us and uh, very, very annoying people. Anyway, as I was saying, I wanted to talk about uh, Archer's Brigade. James J. Archer, Brigadier General in the Confederacy. Um, a very interesting man. Uh, he was born in uh, Havre Grace, Maryland, well, just outside Havre Grace, Maryland, a beautiful house overlooking the Susquehanna River, in 1817. For the first 30 years of his life, um, he was a student, um, a student um, at uh, University of Maryland at Princeton, uh, a law graduate from the University of Maryland and practiced law in Harford County. He comes from a family of doctors and attorneys in Harford County, one of the smaller rural counties to the north of Baltimore City. So for the first 30 years of his life, um, that's what he does. He's a local attorney. And then along comes the uh, Mexican-American War and he volunteers for service with the United States Army. He's given a temporary commission in the United States Army, goes off to war, has a very good war, as people would say in those days. He's uh, cited for meretricious conduct at the Battle of Chapultepec, and he ends the war breveted major. So he returns to civilian life, returns to his law practice, but very soon he realizes that his passion is for military service. So uh, James Archer rejoins the United States military. Uh, he is posted to um, the Pacific Coast, the Pacific Northwest, the Oregon Territory, the Washington Territory, and he's serving there at the outbreak of the Civil War, uh, 1861. So as the states are starting to secede from the Union and individual officers are making their own decisions on uh, where they will go in this conflict, uh, Archer is from Maryland. Now, Maryland is a border state. Uh, it's a state that remained within the Union but it was a state with some divided loyalties. The majority of troops that were raised in Maryland fought with Union regiments, um, multiple infantry regiments, cavalry regiments, artillery batteries, etc. There were, however, Confederate sympathizers in Maryland. Uh, they moved south to Virginia and were able to form um, uh, Maryland infantry, uh, Maryland cavalry, and some artillery batteries. Uh, Maryland infantry in particular fought here at Gettysburg over on Culp's Hill. We did a tour, I think last year, talking about the Maryland versus Maryland conflict over on Culp's Hill. So Archer is a Confederate sympathizer and he decides that his sympathies with the Confederacy are gonna require him to resign his commission in the United States Army, travel east and join the Confederate Army. Now he reaches the east and joins the Confederate Army but he's not assigned to a Maryland unit. Um, the Maryland unit has enough officers of its own, and 
the Confederate Army, in the same way that the Union Army is, as it's expanding in size, these militia units are, are being brought into service, volunteer units are being brought into service, everybody is desperate for professional military officers. And so, uh, as a major, as a preventive major, and Archer has this war experience from the Mexican-American War, he has peacetime garrison military administrative experience, um, from his time in the 1850s. So Archer is an experienced officer and is in demand. So he quickly finds himself promoted to colonel and then he finds himself uh, promoted eventually to brigadier general and appointed to command a brigade in the uh, Army of Northern Virginia. Now the brigade he commands, Archer's Brigade as we call it, um, at the Battle of Gettysburg here, Archer's Brigade forms part of uh, Harry Heth's division, so in A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps. And Archer's Brigade comprises five regiments. Uh, it's a mixed brigade, so quite often when we come out to Gettysburg and we look at the monuments to the Confederate brigades, we notice that a brigade will be entirely North Carolinian or entirely Georgian or entirely Virginian. We don't see many mixed brigades. Well, Archer's is a mixed brigade. It has two regiments of Alabama infantry, uh, the 5th and the 13th, and it has three regiments of Tennessee infantry, 1st Provisional, 7th and 14th Tennessee. So five regiments, sons of Alabama, sons of Tennessee, and they form Archer's Brigade. Now, Archer's Brigade, of course, um, has and those regiments have participated. If we go back and look at the individual histories of those regiments, we'll see that some of those have been raised as far back as 1861 at the beginning of the war. So these are veteran troops. These are men that have had experience in uh, um, the Seven Days Battles out on the peninsula, Second Bull Run, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and are now in June and July of 1863, moving north into Pennsylvania, and it will bring them to this town called Gettysburg. So Archer's Brigade has the distinction, two, well, two distinctions actually. Uh, one of the curious things about Archer's Brigade is it's also one of the uh, units that has two monuments to itself on the battlefield here at Gettysburg. There are two monuments to Archer's Brigade. So I'm actually down by the second of those monuments today. I was at the first earlier on, but as you can see from the sky, it's a little dark and overcast and there's a lot of wind. So uh, it was a little windy up there and noise on the microphone. I decided that I'd move down where I'm in a more covered position um, off on West Confederate Avenue down by the second um, Memorial to Archer's Brigade. So if you know the battlefield, you go past the North Carolina Memorial, just past the Tennessee Memorial, and as West Confederate Avenue dips down uh, there, just past the Tennessee Memorial, two monuments down from that on, on your right is uh, uh, Archer's Brigade. So that's kind of where I am and I'm kind of sheltering in the lee of the tree line at the moment. I will move around a little bit later as I start talking about um, third day of the battle. But we want to talk about the first day of the battle. Archer's uh, Brigade has the distinction of being the first uh, Confederate unit to be engaged on July the 1st, the first day of battle. It's the lead brigade of uh, Heth's division as it is moving towards Gettysburg. Now, earlier, uh, the day before, uh, Pettigrew's brigade had made a reconnaissance along the Cashtown Road and noticed that there were Union troops moving around in Gettysburg and outside of Gettysburg. Uh, Pettigrew withdrew. Um, they were under orders not to bring about a general engagement. Uh, reported back to Heth that there were troops ahead of him. And a discussion ensued that evening on who those troops might be. And now we know today that those troops were John Buford's cavalry, uh, cavalry division. He brought two brigades with him. His third brigade was in reserve down at Emmitsburg. But he had two brigades of cavalry with him and a battery of guns. Um, the discussion amongst the Confederate officers within Heth's division was whether these were home guard, militia, and uh, what to do. Now, uh, early, Jubal Early's division of uh, Richard Ewell's Corps, Second Corps, had already moved through Gettysburg some few days before, I believe the 26th of June, had moved through Gettysburg and requisitioned supplies as it moved further east towards York and the Susquehanna River. So uh, Confederates had already passed through Gettysburg a few days beforehand. They'd requisitioned supplies, so they'd taken grain, they'd taken horses, they'd taken um, whatever they needed to keep themselves going, including, of course, shoes. Um, an army marches on its feet as well as its stomach. 
And so uh, any store that sold shoes would have been stripped of those shoes. And there was no shoe factory in Gettysburg. We all, we all stri- we're all straight with that one. You, me, Ken Burns, we're all straight with that one. There was no shoe factory in Gettysburg. There were tanneries in Gettysburg, tanning leather, which would produce leather that could have been turned into shoes by an individual craftsman. So if there were shoemakers, individual shoemakers in the town, but there was no factory um, producing shoes. I'm not quite sure where Ken Burns got that idea and that the idea that the battle was fought over shoes. Anyway, that aside, um, so the discussion was on the evening of um, June 30th, July the 1st, what was ahead of them. And they believed it was just going to be home guard and militia and that they would be able to march into Gettysburg as third corps would march into Gettysburg, as Jubal Early had marched in a few days beforehand, requisition whatever he hadn't taken and help equip um, the Army of Northern Virginia. Because this was the plan, Lee's plan, logistical plan for the Army of Northern Virginia was that he'd essentially cut his logistical ties back to the Shenandoah Valley. There was no logistical train for the Army of Northern Virginia. They'd marched north into uh, Maryland into Pennsylvania and they were living off the land they were living off the fat of the land it was high summer so the weed had been cut um, forage was in the barns so hay was in the barns for the horses and uh, uh, wheat had been cut so wheat was available uh, it's July so the corn is only really going to be about knee high uh, of the, so maize was not quite ripe at that period but there was certainly wheat available certainly apples and peaches were coming in uh, certainly peaches were coming in and um Uh, wheat was available and forage was available for the horses so they were living off the land and that was why they wanted to go down into um, Gettysburg and see what was there and and take what supplies they could so on the morning of July the 3rd uh, sorry on the morning of July the 1st uh, Heth sets his division in motion the lead brigade is uh, uh, Archer's brigade and it's the lead off brigade and they come marching down Cashtown Pike, they'd camped at Cashtown the night before, they'd come down Cashtown Turnpike, um, they probably did not stop and pay the toll on the Turnpike, um, but they marched down <laughs> Cashtown Turnpike towards Gettysburg, and as they advance towards Gettysburg and they're advancing towards um, the other side of Willoughby Run now, beyond, Hers- beyond McPherson's Ridge, beyond Hers Ridge, beyond Willoughby Run, down to where the uh, uh, first shot marker is, just down by the airport now. Um, as they're coming down there, they're not anticipating a fight. They're marching along the road in column. They're not deployed for battle. They don't really have skirmishers out. They're not expecting trouble. They're marching in column, four abreast, in formation, along the road. Um, around that point is where the uh, 8th Illinois Cavalry, uh, the vedettes of the 8th Illinois Cavalry, uh, encounter that brigade. They fire those first shots of the battle around 7, 7.30 in the morning. And, and the ball is rolling, uh, as it were. The, the, uh, um, the Battle of Gettysburg commences that morning. So Archer's Brigade starts to take fire. Um, now, we have to now look at what John Buford has done. Now, John Buford has two brigades of cavalry here. He doesn't have all of his division up. He only has one uh, battery of artillery, six-gun battery of artillery with him. And he's deployed his men in an arc to the west of Gettysburg, I'm trying to hold the high ground, and he's trying to hold that with traditional cavalry action. He does not want the Confederates to know that it's cavalry. If they know it's cavalry, they can be pushed hard and driven back because cavalry are armed with uh, shorter range carbines, uh, will not necessarily have the logistical train to bring up more ammunition, and certainly will not have a large artillery support. Buford wants to trick the Confederates into thinking that they're facing infantry. So he resorts to dragoon tactics, uh, good standard dismounted cavalry tactics. So uh, as every four men come forward, three dismount and go forward into the skirmish line. Fourth man takes charge of all four horses and moves back. So Buford has deployed his men on foot, behind uh, fence rails, behind uh, hedgerows, behind um, brick walls. He's taken that six-gun battery, Caliph's battery of six guns, and split that into three two-gun sections, spread them out as well, so that when the Confederates move in and when he opens fire on the Confederates, um, they won't be able to tell how many 
units are firing against them. They think that maybe there will be three batteries firing against them. He spread that artillery out a little bit, and they will perhaps think that they're being engaged by uh, cavalry. These are uh, men that are they haven't got repeating carbines, but they've got breech-loading carbines, so they can maintain a very decent rate of fire. So one man can be putting out several shots per minute faster than a man in an infantry unit would be with a musket. So one man may appear to be several men to the Confederates from the amount of fire that's coming in. Uh, this, of course, causes Archer uh, some confusion. He did not expect to meet a uh, 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 stiff response. He certainly did not expect to meet artillery, and he didn't expect to meet this gunfire. So uh, Archer presses forward, and... Uh, the engagement continues, the engagement continues. Now, they're under orders, of course, not to bring on a general engagement, but they still think, like, well, this doesn't make sense, but, like, maybe the home, the infantry, the home guard, the militia have got a couple of cannon up, you know, we, we can probably push them out. This results in um, Archer's brigade moving out of column and into line. So it deploys for line of battle. Uh, the brigade coming up behind Archer is Davis's brigade. Davis's brigade also moves out. And so Archer's brigade, as we're coming in from Chambersburg, so we're coming in from the west, and we're coming towards the east down Chambersburg Pike, Archer's brigade will deploy to the right of the road. Davis's brigade will deploy to the left of the road in line of battle moving forward against those cavalry units. So as they come across Hur's Ridge and as they come across uh, McPherson's Ridge, Delaying actually the cavalry is the skirmish lines will fall back upon a skirmish line behind them. It's a continual delaying action. Buford is trying to buy time, waiting for the left wing of the Army of the Potomac, the infantry body, to come up. So that's um, John Reynolds is um, in command of 1st Corps and the wing of the Army. Behind him is 11th Corps. Behind them is 3rd Corps. There's three Army Corps coming up and are going to reach the field. Two are going to reach the field in time for the battle this day. Um, the 1st Corps under Reynolds and 11th Corps under Howard. And John Buford knows that he just needs to delay for long enough to get John Reynolds and his infantrymen onto the field. So that's what um, the, the role of the cavalry uh, division is that, that morning and that afternoon. So Archer's Brigade, um, those five regiments, two from Alabama, three from Tennessee, deploy to the right of the road. And as they come in um, towards McPherson's Ridge and... That's the correct pronunciation, not McPherson, it's McPherson, McPherson, Scottish name, Scots, Scots-Irish, good Protestant Scots-Irish name, McPherson. So as they're coming in across McPherson's Ridge, or towards McPherson's Ridge, um, Archer um, doesn't like the open ground, he doesn't like the fact that um, the artillery have him in open ground, so he's looking for whatever cover he can get. Now when we look at woodland today, um, there's a lot of undergrowth here and a lot of choking. So when we go back across to um, where the McPherson barn is and Herb's Woods, um, uh, a German Pennsylvanian, so we've got Scots-Irish Pennsylvanians and German Pennsylvanian names there. So Herb's Woods today, uh, which is where Archer sought cover and to maneuver through um, the, the tree line, maneuver through this woodlot. But it was a woodlot, so it's not overgrown trees. Um, a woodlot would have no ground cover at all. That would have been eaten out by hogs and cattle. Um, the low branches would have been cut for wood, for firewood. And it would have been a much more of a orderly orchard type environment than it is today. If you go across to Herb's Woods today and walk into it, um, there's walking trails through it, but the undergrowth is very tangly. There's a lot of bracken on the ground, a lot of um, small trees in between that need to be uh, cleaned out and felled but it would have been a much more open lot but it still provided some cover to Archer's brigade as they moved into town that day and so Archer used what is Herb's Woods as cover to come up on the right here the Confederate right uh, the Union left and to try and turn the Union flank um, he has some success in pushing back um, those cavalry skirmish lines but when he reaches the woodland it is too late. The delay that uh, Buford has been able to uh, uh, inflict upon Heth's division has given time for John Reynolds to bring up the first um, lead division of the First Corps and get them onto the field of battle and get brigades in line. And he is able to throw in the Iron Brigade into Herbst Woods and the Iron Brigade um, is able to push 
Archer's Brigade initially back as far as Willoughby Run and across back across Willoughby Run. So the fighting goes back and forth through what's now Herb's Woods and on McPherson's Ridge. That is where John Reynolds, um, Major General commanding First Corps, also commanding this entire wing of the army, so the senior officer on the field, uh, is uh, mortally wounded, uh, shot from his horse and falls and dies on McPherson's Ridge. And uh, that, of course, creates some confusion. Uh, command will devolve to the next senior officer present, which will be Major General Abner Doubleday, a uh, um, division commander, who will take command of what's left of First Corps and try and organise them in a defensive position. But by now, um, the rest of Heth's division is moving up. All the brigades of Heth's division are coming into play against uh, the Union force there. So not just Archer's division, uh, not just Archer's brigade, Davis's brigade, but Pettigrew's brigade. Everybody's coming forward, Pender, and so forth. The whole of AP Hill's third corps is coming up behind them, and coming over Oak Ridge is Rhodes' division of second corps. So second corps are beginning to arrive on the field as well. So the overwhelming uh, balance of manpower is now shifting from uh, the Union defenders to uh, the Confederates in the. Uh, in the assault as they're overwhelming. But it doesn't go well for James Archer himself. So Archer's brigade is named after James Archer. Uh, the Confederates typically name brigades after the brigade commander. And so you'll notice that a brigade may change its name over time, depending on who's in command of the brigade. So the brigade here is known as Archer's brigade, but the battle does not go well for James J. Archer. In that fighting uh, through Herb's Woods and across Willoughby Run, he's actually captured. He's captured by um, Union troops. He is the most senior officer captured on the field of the Confederacy that day. Uh, they capture a brigadier general. Imagine that, capturing a brigadier general. So when we're talking about, for example, um, in the fighting that's going on in Ukraine at the moment, and the number of uh, Russian general officers that have been uh, killed or wounded in the front lines, you're thinking that's a very strange thing for like general officers to be in the front line. But it was a very common thing for uh, field officers that wanted to be seen on horseback and wanted to be seen that they were leading their men and encouraging their men forward. It was a much more um, personal directed uh, battle. Um, so there was no command post in the rear linking them forward with telegraph and telephone. Uh, if a brigadier wanted to know what his brigade was doing, what his five regiments were doing, he needed to be on his horse up front with them. And that's how Archer finds himself captured. He is captured. He will spend most of the rest of the war until uh, 1864 in prison, until he's exchanged in a, in a prisoner exchange, um, but suffering from ill health um, as a result of wounds uh, occurred during the war and uh, illness and sickness picked up in, in uh, the prisoner of war camp, he'll actually um, die before the end of 1864. So it's a sorry end for James Archer himself. And the brigade itself on the first day has been roughly handled, particularly by the Iron Brigade, the Union Iron Brigade, has given them a, 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 bloody, a bloody good nose, you know, a bloody nose. They've given, them a good, they've given them a good run for their money. Now, first call withdraw. Uh, will eventually essentially break and retreat in a routed form through the town, 11th Corps will retreat, and they will all end up on uh, East Cemetery Hill and then deploying onto what is Cemetery Ridge over there to the, to the east. Um, Archer's Brigade has taken a licking and is in really no fit state to participate in any activity on July 2nd. So on July the 2nd, Archer's Brigade moved back up here into where Macmillan Woods is along what's now Confederate Avenue and into the ground behind there where is uh, the Eisenhower Farm in that dip down there and they reorganized themselves, they sort out their wounded, they sort out their cat, they count off how many men they've lost, how many men uh, killed, wounded, uh, missing, presumed, captured. Um, they're able to resupply with ammunition, um, get something to eat and put themselves in position on July the 2nd for continuing the fight on July the 3rd. Now, July the 3rd is really the big day for the Confederacy um, here at um, Gettysburg. So July the 2nd has that assault over there on the right towards Little Round Top. It has the assault um, on the left towards uh, Culp's Hill. And those are uh, important events on July 2nd, but the big one that everybody wants to talk about and the big one that everybody talks about when they come on the tour here at Gettysburg and everybody wants to stop at the, the big Virginia Memorial and talk about it is Pickett's Charge. It's a centerpiece of the movie 
and so it's the centerpiece of I think most people's um, what they want to know about Gettysburg is like there are very few actions they want to know about. A little round top on the 20th Main, they want to know about Pickett's Charge. Um, those are good entries to the study of the battle and uh, if you want to come out and walk the ground and you want to come and, and park your vehicle or uh, get dropped off at the Virginia Memorial and actually walk that mile and a half across um, following in the footsteps of Pickett's Charge. That's a great thing to do. You get a very good understanding of the battlefield by doing that. If you go up onto Little Round Top and you want to get that experience of uh, and walking around Little Round Top on the slopes of that, get the experience of the 20th Main. These are very good ways to understand the battle and are very good entries to the battle. Um, you don't need to be an expert on every piece of minutia on the battle. Um, everybody has to get into the battle in their own way and those are good ways to get into the battle. So Pickett's Charge. Uh, Archer's Brigade will participate in Pickett's Charge. Now, it's not part of Pickett's Division, it's not part of Longstreet's Corps. So Pickett's Charge itself is kind of a misnomer. It's kind of like the name that's been assigned to it because George Pickett is such a, a flamboyant, easily recognisable figure with his curly hair and his beard and his larger-than-life personality. Um, so it's referred to as Pickett's Charge. The majority of the men did not even come from Longstreet's Corps. The majority of the men involved in the uh, assault on July the 3rd, that afternoon assault, um, came from A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps. So strictly speaking, Pickett's Charge is the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble Charge. There are multiple divisions involved and multiple brigades within those divisions. So the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble Charge, sometimes known as Longstreet's Assault. Um, Longstreet, as the Corps Commander, uh, First Corps was given overall command of the assault, um, and you recall, of course, he did say, you know, um, well, you know, does A.P. Hill want it? And more of A.P. Hill's men are in that, but like, no, Lee insisted that um, Longstreet, being the more experienced commander, being the more experienced Corps commander, and perhaps more trusted Corps commander than A.P. Hill, be put in charge of that insult. So, here we are now then, and I'm just if the wind plays up a little bit, that will be a bit of a problem, but not so much. So I'm now on West Confederate Avenue as it was, and right across the other side there is the marker, to point with my walking stick, the marker for uh, Archer's Brigade. Beyond that, of course, the Eisenhower Farm in the background there. So we're on Confederate Avenue, and we are facing the direction now from the west to the east over onto Cemetery Ridge. So we have some little white buildings over there in Ziegler's Grove. So where it connects to East Cemetery Hill, we move along the ridge. Hang on, I'm going the wrong way. We move along the ridge from Ziegler's Grove all the way along Cemetery Ridge. And we can see, um, if we can just, Ziegler's Ridge. Can we see the Pennsylvania? Let me see if we can zoom in a little. The, I'm a little far away from the monuments, but anyway, pen, here we are over across there towards um, Cemetery Ridge. So we're in the position now. The Tennessee Memorial is right there beside me. So when we're talking about Archer's Brigade, we're talking about um, Three of his five regiments were Tennessee regiments. That's 1st Provisional, 7th and 14th Tennessee. And this is the position in which they were in. And as you can see, there is no cover. This is open farmland as it was on July the 3rd, 1863. And they got to go that way. Now, if you've ever looked at a, um, an artillery schematic for the battle, the Union have an artillery schematic which shows the location of every Union battery on the afternoon of July the 3rd. And if you look at their intersecting fields of fire, if you draw lines from where those batteries are positioned, the entire field here is covered by interlocking artillery fire. It's a killing ground. There's no way to walk across this without taking horrendous casualties. Well, Archer's Brigade, move across. Now, Archer's Brigade is not under the command of um, General Archer. It's under the command of Colonel Fry, now of the 13th Alabama an experienced officer. He's been wounded four times before, and today's gonna to be the day that he's wounded for the fifth time in battle. Now, the brigade make it almost as far as the tree line. 
they make it as far as um, some of the fence lines there and get into a tangle with the Union troops in the Union position. Um, Colonel Fry is wounded for the fifth time in his career and taken prisoner. Um, command of the brigade will devolve to um, Colonel Shepard of the 7th Tennessee. He'll take command of what's left of the brigade. But the fighting over there is horrendous. And this brigade is taking phenomenal casualties from artillery as it moves across this open ground. I mean, we're looking about, at this point, this is actually not as wide as the fullest part of Pickett's Charge. So we're about a mile. You've got to cover a mile of open ground to that first big fence line cross that. Then beyond that is the Emmitsburg Road. And beyond that is the, uh, the Cemetery Ridge itself. So they've got to cover a mile of open ground under artillery fire. And as they get closer to the Union line, they're going to come under musket fire, oh, sorry, musketry fire, so rifled musket fire. And then as they get closer and they want to go in with the bayonet, well, they're going to have to meet Union troops man for man with the bayonet and the rifle butt as well. And then at that point, the artillery is now firing canister and tearing huge holes in these brigades as they advance across there across this field, across this open ground. Um, it's one of those things that when we talk about Pickett's Charge, and if you look at the movie and the slowness of the, how they move and the hero heroism of, you know, the cheering and the waving and, and the actor playing Lou Armistead and you know that he's kind of like fatally, um, there's something bad going to happen to him, but these are men that are covering open ground under gunfire. And you've got to have a special kind of determination um, to go forward uh, under that kind of gunfire. These are not men that are um, new to the battle. These are veteran troops. These are men that have been in many engagements before. And even though they're under heavy fire, they press forward. Um, there's an inscription on the rear of the Tennessee Memorial um, that reads that, the, that talks about the three Tennessee regiments that were here in Archer's Brigade and says that they uh, fought and died for what they believed in and uh, that they did their duty as they saw it. So uh, we can talk today about the rights and wrongs of, uh, of the causes of the war. I'm going to move out of the wind because I'm in a very windy location again. We can talk today about the rights and wrongs of the causes of the war and I think we'll all agree that um, you know the causes of the war uh, are complex but often just boil, boil down to um, you know uh, arguments and sectional di sectional division over issues such as slavery so but at the time those men um, fought for as the memorial says what they considered to be their duty and they did their duty out here on the field today on that day they 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 advanced under heavy fire um, under the guns and into the guns into the mouth of death now the five regiments that advanced as I said um, Colonel Fry was wounded and taken capture of the five regiments of Archer's Brigade that advanced that day uh, four of the regimental battle flags so we're talking five regiments and they've had five battle flags four of the regimental battle flags were captured by the Union um, so the fighting, the fighting was that intense that um, I believe as they went across this field that 17 separate color bearers were shot down and the, and the, and the colors of these regiments were knocked down. Um, 17 regimental color bearers were knocked down, but men would pick up the flags and continue forward. Eventually four of those flags would fall into Union hands. When the survivors of the battle of uh, the charge return to the Confederate lines here on what's now Confederate Avenue, when the survivors return and they take a muster of the numbers of uh, men that have been lost, the entire brigade numbers no more now than 400 men. Some of the regiments have taken phenomenal losses. Um, I believe the, some of the Tennessee regiments um, with a number of captured as well, um, particularly uh, uh, the, the men that reached the, the Union position and were wounded and then also captured, and men that were just exhausted and were captured because they were unable to, they didn't have the strength, the physical strength to retreat. They were exhausted by the hot sun and the march across there with 40 pounds of equipment. Um, the losses in some of these units were 50, 60 percent. So half, two thirds of, of these units were um, casualties, killed, wounded, uh, captured or, or missing. And so phenomenal losses in Archer's Brigade, um, very high losses and 
400 men left as a result of the brigade at the end of the day is uh, uh, incredible losses. And I don't know, I'm, it doesn't matter which unit we're talking about on the field here at Gettysburg. It doesn't matter which unit we're talking about at uh, Antietam or Fredericksburg or any of the other great battles of the Civil War when we've been out to those battlefields. Um, you're really struck that uh, the men pressed forward and kept fighting. And I'm not sure that, um, I don't know whether I have that level of personal courage that under those circumstances, as a Union soldier or a Confederate soldier or in the Revolutionary War as a, as a Hessian soldier or a, or a con member of the Continental Line, I don't know whether I'd have had the personal courage to do what those men did. I mean, what they did was uh, um, amazing um, under the circumstances. The, um, and what you have to put up with on those battlefields during that time is, is, is quite horrific, and, and those men persevered. So um, no matter what side they're on, I think you know, we have to acknowledge the courage on the battlefield for um, uh, both Union and Confederates during the Battle of uh, uh, Gettysburg itself, the individual courage displayed by individual men and the, and the courage displayed by uh, units here on the battlefield is, is quite phenomenal, which makes it, I think, one of the... Uh, m that's perhaps why it's one of the most uh, pivotal and interesting battles of the Civil War, uh, not just through numbers involved, not just through numbers of casualties, but um, through some of the shot and shell from the, of the big epic events, such as Pickett's Charge, um, it's just uh, remarkable that anybody was able to get through that and persevere through that. So uh, Archer's Brigade then uh, on July the 3rd are back here with 400 men. And on July the 4th, as Lee's army departs, um, Archer's Brigade with Hess Division will make its way back west across the mountains through Chambersburg, um, back towards Hagerstown, Hagerstown, Maryland across there, really at the top of the Shenandoah Valley, and then the Army of the Northern Virginia will slip back into the, into the Shenandoah Valley and back into Virginia itself. So, um, Archer's Brigade I find interesting. Um, yesterday, I took a trip out to um, Rock Run, the uh, birthplace of James J. Archer, posted a few photographs in the group uh, in the post for that, just to give a view of what his house looked like. And uh, it's a sizable house. So you can see that he came from a quite a prominent family. Um, so it's just interesting that um, I actually live um, five miles from that house. So uh, I've lived in Maryland for 20 something years and I've never been down to that house in my life. And I thought, you know what? I need to go down to the house today and like take some photographs and uh, get an appreciation for uh, where James Archer came from. Um, in the uh, county courthouse in Harford County, Maryland, and the old ceremonial courthouse, the courthouse that was built in 1859, so the nice red brick one on Main Street. And there's a ceremonial courthouse, the old original courtroom. And there's kind of like a, almost a rogue gallery of uh, local notables that are in there, um, famous people from the county that are in there. And one of the portraits that hangs in there is of James Archer. Uh, his, uh, uh, his portrait hangs there in the ceremonial courthouse. It's not exactly that he's celebrated, it's just that, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are, um, portraits of them hang up there in the courthouse in uh, Bel Air, Maryland. So, as I said, James J. Archer did not survive the war himself, um, taken prisoner here on July the 1st, um, uh, had some illnesses in captivity when he was exchanged, those illnesses continued and he died of those uh, illnesses before the end of the war. So it's quite a sad story for him personally. Um, lamentable story for Archer's Brigade here. Heavily engaged on July the 1st, heavily engaged on July the 3rd, took some significant casualties in participating, particularly in that um, picket, Pettigrew, Trimble charge on July the 3rd. So that's really the story of Archer's Brigade. Um, as I say, there are two monuments to them here on the battlefield at Gettysburg. If the wind will cooperate with me, I will walk across to the one that's on the far side of Confederate Avenue. You have to excuse me, I, uh, I'm walking with a stick today. I blew my knee out this morning, uh, cleaning out horse stalls. Uh, so, and it was stormy weather last night, had to keep the horses indoors. Naturally, they trashed their stalls and those needed to be cleaned out. So that was me at uh, half past six and seven o'clock this morning, cleaning horse stalls blew my knee out doing that. 
So I'm walking with the stick I'm a little bit slow this morning. So here, I'm actually at the monument, but let's take a few and get a glorious glimpse at the Eisenhower farm down there. Uh, say hi to Ike. Here we are at one of the two memorials to Archer's Brigade. So Confederate Avenue, there's my car parked way up on the hill. Confederate Avenue extends down there just beyond where the tree line ends there is the Virginia Memorial. Just at the top of the hill there as you're coming in is the North Carolina and Tennessee Memorial. So that's kind of where we are. And this is one of the two monuments to Archer's Brigade. There's one down towards the first day's action and this one here is towards the second day's action. So I'll read it right off the board as it appears here. Army of Northern Virginia, Hills Corps, Heth's Division, Archer's Brigade. 5th Battalion and 13th Alabama, 1st, 7th and 14th Tennessee Infantry. July the 1st, reached the field in the morning. The battalion was ordered to watch cavalry on the right. That's 1st Tennessee. The four regiments advancing into Reynolds Woods, that's Herb's Woods, also known as Reynolds Woods, were met and flanked by the 1st Brigade, 1st Division, 1st Corps, Iron Brigade, and fell back across Willoughby Run, losing 75 prisoners, including Brigadier General Archer. That's what it records the first day's battle. July 2nd, in the evening, marched from the woods west of Willoughby Run and took position near here. July the 3rd, in Longstreet's assault, so that's what we call the picket, Pettigrew Trimble assault, in Longstreet's assault was the right brigade of Pettigrew's division, advanced to the stone wall at the angle, and some of the men leaped over it, had 13 colour bearers shot, four of them at the wall, lost four of the five flags and five of seven field officers with company officers and men in the same proportion. July the 4th, after night withdrew and began the march to Hagerstown. So at the beginning of the battle, present 1,048 men, killed and wounded 160, missing 517 from total of 677 casualties. So as they say, about 400 men remaining at the end of the battle. Uh, one of two monuments to the brigade, the other one being up near the first day's battle. So as I'm walking back up um, towards the north at the moment, up and walking north up, walking north on West Confederate Avenue, that just seems kind of like a misnomer. I'm walking up to where I parked up by where the AP Hill core monument is, across from the Tennessee monument and across from uh, Pogue's artillery battery. So actually let me zip across the road and we can get to the Tennessee Memorial. Oh, excuse my knee. It's a beautiful day out here in Gettysburg. It's a magnificent sky alternating between grey and blue and but quite chilly with this wind so that's why we have to be wrapped up warm today in the position now of Pogue's artillery battery it's a mixed battery uh, comprising uh, uh, two three-inch ordnance rifles model 1861 uh, one 10 pounder Parrot and one 12 pounder Howitzer. So that's uh, Pogue's battalion. I think this is Wyatt's battery. Yeah, I believe this is Wyatt's battery. Uh, Albemarle, Virginia um, artillery battery that was assigned to AP Hill's Corps. So if you're going around the battlefield and you ever see cannon standing upright. That's usually a corps commander's position. That one over there is to AP Hill for third corps. And we're now at the Tennessee monument itself. And this is the Tennessee monument. of it is 
the shape of the state of Tennessee. And on the rear, of course, it commemorates the three regiments, 1st, 7th, 14th Tennessee, that fought in Archer's Brigade. So that's where we are. And uh, you can get any view. Okay, got a slightly better view up there of, uh, as you can see in the distance, Cemetery Hill, Cordery Farm, Ziegler's Grove across over there. So that's where we are. If you're on the battlefield, you'll be able to oh, find this position for yourself. And if you find this fence line and you walk clear along this fence line, so don't walk through the person, don't, don't walk through the crops, stick to the fence line, walk across this fence line. It will take you all the way up to the Emmitsburg Road and it will take you all the way up to Ziegler's Grove where those white buildings are. You can follow that all the way up there. Uh, if you want to rewalk this ground, cover the ground that those men did on July the 3rd. So if I can just get out of the wind slightly, I might take advantage of the Tennessee Memorial itself. So that pretty much wraps up today, um, talking about Archer's Brigade, how when we talk about an individual unit um, and where that individual unit served on July 1st, July 2nd, July 3rd, we can learn a lot more um, about the, the Battle of Gettysburg because we're drilling down to a uh, more micro level than that overall view of this corps did this and this corps did that. We can get down to individual men like um, James Archer, uh, Colonel Fry, Colonel Shepard and so forth and the men that were involved in that of the 5th and 13th Alabama, 1st, 7th and 14th Tennessee. So that pretty much wraps up today. Thank you for joining me today from a chilly but quite bright Gettysburg today. We're back at Gettysburg next week. We're doing the 88th um, New York. Yeah, New York. What are we doing next week? Actually, I don't know where we are next week, so I'll have to check that out. There's so many things lined up on events on the Facebook page, live streams. Um, we've got events scheduled throughout April and into May now. So head on over to the Facebook page. That's the Facebook page that this live stream is on, facebook.com slash walking the ground. Click on events. You'll see all the events that we have listed. Um, some are coming up with uh, civil war events. We have revolutionary war event coming up. We have a uh, war of um, uh, French and Indian war event coming up. We even have a 1655 early colonial uh, event coming up. So we're really running the range from 17th, 18th, the 19th century in the next uh, couple of weeks here so click on those um, share those links with people that you might be think you might be interested in those thank you for joining me today um, follow me on Facebook as you most of you probably are do not click on those spam links we will deal with those as soon as I get off this uh, live stream uh, follow us on Twitter at uh, twitter.com slash what are we at walking ground uh, we're also on telegram we're also on coffee we're also on uh, TikTok. We're, we're all over the place as walking the ground um, I do appreciate the support that you give me as i say these are uh, free little live stream tours that we do and uh, i do appreciate uh, any donations of coffee you know, if you want to click on the link for coffee.com and send me a three dollar coffee so I can go to Dunkin Donuts now and warm up after this day out here on the battlefield I would greatly appreciate that but um, I will see you next week for another tour and I will save this video for the Facebook page and also I will upload it to YouTube so you guys can see it um, if people missed it today they can watch it on Facebook later or watch it on YouTube later on thank you for joining me today do appreciate all the support and I'm gonna get out of the cold and find myself something warm to drink <laughs>